Okay, so let's get started with the lecture. We are done with the first part of the semester and the midterm is behind us. This is good. And now we're moving in the second part we, where we're going to talk about high level vision, right? Okay, so very cool moving on to what everyone was waiting for. High level vision. Now high level vision, we're gonna spend most of the rest of the course, not all of it, but most of it, talking about high level vision. There are many topics in high level vision that we'll talk about. There are some topics that are less high level, if I can use that word, and other topics are gonna be really high, high level uh, vision, right? And that depends on the complexity of the visual task that we need to solve. So the most obvious uh, high level vision task that you're probably most familiar with and that you've heard all over the news constantly is object recognition, right? So object recognition is the task of taking a picture or we'll see later a video sequence, but we're mostly gonna focus on pictures you take a picture of an object, right, like this one, and the algorithm says, oh, it's a table, right? And if I take a picture of the chair behind it, the algorithm will say, oh, it's a chair. If I take a picture of a person, say, oh, it's a person. Take a picture of a door, it's gonna say, oh, it's a door, and so on, right? So that's what we want. That's the most basic one, but then we're gonna complicate things, right? Because objects are nothing else than nouns, right? A noun defines an object but there are other things that we can define. For example, verbs, right? Verbs are typically, not always, but typically actions, okay? And then for those, uh, we will most likely work with video because video actually defines uh, actions better than just a single image. But we can also uh, do some recognition of, of actions in a single image, right? Because we imply what the action is. Uh, we're also going to talk about, I forgot to say, in object recognition, we're also going to spend some time work, uh, talking about face recognition, which is one of the main topics uh, that uh, has a great success right, in industry uh, within object recognition. And then for action recognition, we're going to complicate this even further. So action recognition is even more advanced or more, more difficult than object recognition. And then we're going to make things even more difficult. We're going to talk about things such as emotion recognition and the goals of people, the intent of people, and so on. So we will keep complicated, complicating the understanding of the, what is observed in an image or in a video sequence. Okay? And all this fits within this high level uh, vision area. All right, now, Let's think about the multiple ways by which we can recognize an object, right? And there are at least two basic components of an object that we covered in detail in 5460 in our course to introduction to image processing and computer vision, right? We spend all that course talking about, or most of the course anyways, talking about these two main components of what defines an object, or a scene, right? We'll briefly talk about the scene analysis as well. This is just another topic. But what are these two components? Anyone from 5460? What's that? Is it age? No. Uh, what do you mean? The edges? Yeah. Right, but what does this define? We just, the shape, right? Shape of an object. We spend the first half of, Im, of image processing computer vision, introduction to image processing computer vision, of course, talking about shape. How can we define the shape of an object? Usually in 3D, right? So that's one way to a study object recognition as well, to use that shape that we spent so long 
uh, discussing how to recover, right, in 5460, how to use that shape to do object recognition. Okay, so here it's say object recognition. Number one is going to be shape. Actually, let me do that. Let's call this one shape. And then we spend almost the other half of the course talking about one other thing. What was it? That was other than shape. Appearance. Well, it has a different name. Anyone? What's that? Uh, well, the structure can be from both of them, from shape or from the other. What is it? Hmm? Texture. texture, but that's not, the t that's not the actual term. But you're right, it's texture, uh, which, is, which we called <laughs> I'm writing shape again. <laughs> Come on, shading. Right? Remember? Okay. The shading of an object. So the shape of the object is given by the geometrical description, right? Of the, as you were saying, the edges, the corners, etc., that define that the structure of the object. The shading is given by the, refract the refraction of the light source onto that object, right? That's the shading, right? Okay, so we're gonna talk about these two different components into object recognition. They can both be used very efficiently to do object recognition. And then we're going to uh, see ways of combining these two to building uh, more advanced systems, okay? So today I want to spend some time talking about the first one, shape, okay? So let's start with shape. And in particular, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time uh, all of today talking about an area that's called statistical shape analysis, okay? So maybe let's do that and talk about statistical shape analysis. And for this, there is a famous book that I recommend if you're interested to dig deep into that area that's called it's very difficult to remember as usual it's called statistical shape analysis <laughs> by uh, the authors are Dryden and Mardia Famous book, very well written, highly recommended. So, let's start with some definitions, right? About what shape is and how we can actually represent shape in some meaningful feature space, okay? Shape space representation. All right, so. Where to begin? How about if we begin with the actual definition for shape, right? That would be interesting, right? That would be useful. <laughs> so how do, how do we define shape? Shape is all the geometrical information. Okay. So all geometric information that remains when location scale and rotation
uh, or let's say location scale and rotational uh, effects are filtered out or eliminated from the object. So, this is important because note that by definition, shape is invariant to any Euclidean or rigid transformation. Right? Remember HS that we defined the similarity transformation? Right? Do we call it HS? I believe so, right? When we talk about the projective space. By definition, the shape of an object is invariant to any such transformation. Not to an affine, not to a projective transformation, but certainly to a rigid Euclidean transformation. Why? Well, let's see why. If I have this object, what's this object called? A marker, okay? Let me translate that object, right? So I change the location, which means I translate it right here. What's this object now called? Still a marker, right? Okay, let me rotate it too. Let's see. I'm going to rotate the object in 3D. What's this object still called? A marker. And if I make it smaller by putting it farther away from you, you see it smaller? What is it called? Still a marker. <laughs> right? So that's why this is our definition of a shape. Shape is the, the scale, the position, and the orientation of that shape is irrelevant to us. Right? What matters is what that shape represents. Now, if I apply an affine transformation, right? So if I have this, right, a plane, and then I apply an affine transformation or a, a projective transformation, right, and then deform it, then that's no longer a plane, <laughs> right? So it's not invariant to affine transformations or projective transformations, but it is to Euclidean transformations. Okay, good. Now, how are we going to define, or, rep or better said, represent that shape? One way to do that, there are multiple ways, but the way that we are going to dip deep into some detail here today is by using what we've been calling landmark points. Okay? So that's what we spend most of low-level vision talking about, how to define the kernels of linear filters, right? Or edge detection methods, right? Or corner detection or union detection and so on. All these different methods are nothing else than using different kernels in a linear filter format to extract landmark points from the image, right? So we're gonna use now these landmark points to define or to better say to represent the shape of our object. Right? Now for this, um, we have to make a distinction between a number or different type of landmarks. So first to landmarks, a landmark is a point of correspondence. on each object uh, that matches between and within populations. Right, so for example, let's see an example. If I have an image of a face, right? This is the eyebrow, the other eyebrow, maybe the eye here, right? The nose and the mouth, okay? Okay, a little skewed, but still a face, right? <laughs> All right, so if I now 
define landmark points, like say, the corners of the eyes, the outer corners or the inner corners of the eyes, are these landmark points? Well, do these points have correspondences across each object, meaning across different faces? Let's say for 99.99999% of the faces, that's true, right? Okay, so good. And do they match between and within populations? Sure, you can uh, work within that population of that individual or that gender or that ethnicity or that what have you, right, that age, and it will still match. And between these populations, they still match, right? So these are good landmark points to represent faces, right? Okay. Is that clear? Good. Now, um, having said that, we have to understand that we cannot always find these point correspondences. And then in those cases, we will not generally talk about landmarks, we'll talk about pseudo landmarks, and I'll talk more about this in a second. Uh, and the reason is because, yeah, I could say that the corners of my eyes, the outer corners of my eyes, correspond to the outer corners of your eyes, right? Okay, we can, get, we can agree to that. But how about this point on my cheek? To which point in your cheek does this correspond to? None, there's no correspondence. We don't have the same number of points <laughs> distributed in, the, in our cheeks. They are not equally defined, right? So this is not only not uh, possible for every point in an object, it's not, we don't want to use any specific point in an object to represent its identity, right? Or its category. Good. Now, um, there are three types of landmarks that we will be using uh, for this. Number one, it's called anatomical landmarks. Now, anatomical landmarks are like these ones that we just draw here for the face. They are points assigned by an expert that knows some correspondences between specimens or items in that object. Okay? They are biologically uh, meaningful. For example, the landmarks on a skull. Right? So if you're studying a specific species, Homo sapiens, or maybe you're studying a species that looks like this. Um, maybe you're studying something um, that looks like this. And this is a side view of the skull. Um, so this is the eye socket. Maybe there is a molar here. Uh, maybe there's a nostril, right? Uh, and maybe there are some specific shapes, right, of that skull that are relevant. Now, if you become an expert in computer vision, right, and an anthropologist, or a paleoanthropologist, I should say, comes to you and says, we've discovered uh, these bones buried in whatever desert, right? Uh, what the species do they correspond to? You could do two things. You could say, oh, let me deal with it, and then identify some random landmark points here that you think are important and get the wrong result in your st scientific analysis. Or you can go back to that expert and say, okay, I need you to tell me which are the anatomical landmarks that are biologically meaningful in that skull. You tell me. I don't know. I'm not an, an uh, paleoanthropologist. Right? <laughs> uh, and then they'll say, oh yeah, sure, that's easy. And they'll probably say, look, this point here, the top of the nostril and the bottom and the sockets, and maybe this one here, maybe here, and maybe this one's here, right? And maybe there's another pointy 
place right there. These are biologically meaningful, and these, then these are the ones that you're going to use. These are always the preferred landmarks. Anything that, is an, uh, that, uh, that defines the anatomy of an object. Okay? Now, if it's not a living species, if it's a, a, an object like a table, then we need to talk about other types of landmarks. Okay? In that case, we are mostly going to talk about, so let's call this A, about B, mathematical landmarks. Now, this is easily defined. Mathematical landmarks are points located on an object according to some mathematical or geometric property. That's it, right? It makes sense, right? So points that are on the object according and are defined according to some mathematical or geometric property. For example, you could identify all the points of high curvature, right? Or all the corners, or all the T unions, or all the K unions. Sounds familiar? Or all the edges, right? Etc. Basically, any mathematical equation that allows you to do low-level vision, that can give you landmark points. Because they have to be point correspondences, it is typically the case that people will use methods like uh, SIFT or SURF to identify landmark points that have point correspondences across images right, of the same object. All right, and the last one, C, are the pseudo landmarks that I have alluded to earlier. Pseudo landmarks are defined as points distributed around the outline or some other internal component, if you will, that's not very relevant, but typically the outline of the object, okay? Um, it could also be the internal part, so for a face, it could be the outline of the face, but it could also be the outline of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, right? So um, let's, let's define it as points distributed around the outline or internal components of an object. So for example, Here's what I could do. I could um, have an algorithm that detects the cheekbone, right? The jawbone, rather, right? On everyone's face. And then once I have detected this with low level vision, I place a spline, right? A quadratic or a cubic curve onto all my edges or uh, points from low level vision that I have detected. And now I, the, I specify the landmarks as equally spaced points on that curve. Right? So to repeat again, so let's say that you have an algorithm that detects edges, right? And you detect that edge down here. Then you approximate that edge with a curve. Maybe using the half transform would be a good idea, right? You, the edge is going to be broken. It's going to have points like this, and use the half transform to find the best curve that defines the jawbone. And then once you have to identify the jawbone, you start with this point and that point, the beginning and the end, and then you equally space all the other points, right? So they're equally spaced. All these points are pseudo landmarks because they don't define an anatomical component or part of that jaw. Right? They are just equally spaced so that your face has the same number of landmarks as my face. <laughs> you see that? But that's why we do it. Okay. Any questions thus far? Good. And then finally, we need to define what a label is, right? The label of the object. And the label is nothing else than a name 
or a number, it could be a number, right? I mean, we always talk about tables, chairs, and so on, but typically when you implement an algorithm, chairs are assigned number one, and tables number two, and uh, doors number three, and projectors number four, and so on, right? And that's it, but it's a label. It has to be a unique label. So a label is a name or a number associated with a landmark and identifies which pairs of landmarks correspond when comparing objects, okay? So for example, the corner of every eye may be a label with a landmark one uh, or as corner of the eye. The eye itself can be labeled as number one or eye. The face can be labeled as face or number one and so on, right? Okay. All right, so with all these definitions, now let's go to shape representation. How are we going to represent shapes? Okay, so there are two shape representations that we'll talk about, one in the real domain and one in the complex domain. So um, let's probably get us started with a few more definitions uh, so that we, we know what we are talking about. Um, all right, so the first one is a configuration, right? So the configuration uh, uh, or a configuration is the set of landmarks on a particular object. Uh, the configuration matrix, and let's call it capital X is a K by M matrix of um, Cartesian coordinates of um, the Cartesian coordinates of the K landmarks in M dimensions, okay? And the configuration space is the space of all possible landmark coordinates. Make sense? So a configuration, nothing else than a set of landmarks, right? The configuration matrix is a matrix of K by M, K the number of landmarks, M the number of dimensions. So if I have landmarks that are two dimensional, I am gonna have X and Y. And if they are three dimensional, X, Y, and Z. And if they are four dimensional, X, Y, Z, T, and so on, right? And the configuration space, it's the space that represents all possible configurations, right? So with that, we can define the size of a shape. And the size of the shape is given by a measure, right? We have to define a measurement for this. And for this, um, I'm gonna say that the size measure 
g of x is any positive real valued function of a configuration matrix capital X such that G of AX is equal to A of GX. for every scalar A. Okay. So if I have a configuration matrix that defines the configuration of the K landmark points, right? And I multiply that by a scalar, right? I'm just scaling it up or down. That measure has to be equal whether I first multiply the matrix or I multiply the measurement G of the matrix, right? Obviously. Simple linear property. Okay, so this is very useful because now it's going to allow us to define shapes as we want. Remember, shapes has to be invariant to translation, rotation, and scale, right? So let's start uh, digging in to see how we can do that. First, to, one of the ways to do this is by defining the centroid size. The centroid size is a function S of X, which is C times X, uh, where this is equal to the sum from 1 to K and from 1 to M of XIJ minus X bar J square square root, okay? Now, x, remember, I uh, could say the centered side of x, x is a k by m matrix, right? True. And thus, a, it's equal to the trace of a transpose A square root. This is the Euclidean metric, right? Okay. Okay or the Euclidean norm. So far so good. A lot of definitions to begin with as usual. Yes, we'll need them to formally define the terms, the main concepts that are gonna go in our algorithms. And you need to really understand all these definitions because when you read the books I recommend or the papers that are out there that define new algorithms that you may want to use, you're going to be using this terminology, right? So we need to know what these things mean. Okay, so how am I going to define that C? So if you want to define that C that makes this equal to this, okay, then I'll leave this as an exercise, but C, if you do your own derivations, C is equal to IK 
minus 1 over k i k 1 k uh, 1 k transpose where this one and this one are, are the identity matrix of k by k dimensions, right? So the k by k identity matrix. And these are a, a vector or a k vector. Let me say that, a k vector of all ones. Okay, so k ones. Okay. So practice this because it's important that you get to learn to do these matrix representations. Maybe I'll give you one more. So leave this as optional homework, right? So say A, B. Why don't I give you another one? So if I do the sum, so you can practice more things at home. J from 1 through M, this is the dimensionality, right, of my landmark points. And I from 1 to K, and L from 1 to K. This is the number of landmark points. And now I want to compute Xij minus Xi H, uh, HLJ. Uh, square, I want you to prove that this is 2 times k s x square. Okay? Practice at home. It'll give you a lot of practice to understand how you derive these algorithms that we're going to see next, right? And the ones that you're going to read in the papers. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, so now let's define the shape of space. We're getting close to defining the algorithms. Very close. So remember that an M by M rotation matrix, right? Let's call this, and I'm following, you call it R. I'm following the notation of that book that I've mentioned by Dryden and Mardia. Uh, they use gamma, so I'm going to use this here. So remember that an M by M rotation matrix satisfies that the gamma transpose gamma is equal to gamma gamma transpose, which is equal to anyone? The identity matrix, good. Phew. I was like, this is basic 5460 stuff, right? Of M dimensions, right? If, it, if this is an M by M matrix. OK. All right. And you could also say that there's another property, right? Uh, actually, the determinant, if you will, uh, is going to be 1, right? OK. Now, the set of all M by M rotation matrices is called, or is known as, the special orthogonal group, and typically written as SOM of M dimensions. And 
Using this, we can define the rigid body transformation. So let's do that. Going, in, going to define uh, the rigid body transformation. of a configuration matrix capital X. Uh, as the set of translated and rotation X. So are the set of translated and rotated X's, right? Or formally, we can write this as x multiplied by any rotation, right? So I multiply my, ro my matrix by rotation matrix, then I get all the possible rotations of my configuration, right? You see that? Plus the translation, okay? Any one for a, a nice, uh, uh, a good extra 0 0.0001 credit points. <laughs> Uh, how am I going to define a translation in this matrix form based on what we've learned here? Anyone? Come on, for a gold star. Let's say for a gold star. Going once, going twice. Come on, should I bump it up to 0.1 extra credit? No one wants to try? So let me call that translation small gamma. Not yet. So I multiply this by a vector of all ones. And that allows me to add this translation to every single element of that configuration. Okay. And now I do the rotation has to be any possible rotation. How do I write down every possible rotation? I use the special orthogonal group, SOM, right? That's what this means, every possible rotation. And any possible translation, which how, how do I define any possible translation? in? in M dimensions, all possible translations. Come on, pick up, don't be shy. Okay, uh, did you say R? Okay, the real space, very good, of how many dimensions? M, just M, right? Just one vector, right? Because we already converted into a matrix here. Excellent, very good. All right, fine. So the net, the other one is that we can use a a complex representation, or representing the complex domain. Um, but before I do that, maybe I could um, give you a, 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 an application of all this. So, so all this, this, this type of representation, when we use the real domain, that actually comes from a famous scientist by the name of Darcy Thompson. And you have this in the slides, but basically what Darcy said, I mean, a very long time ago, is that if you have a, a, a shape, say of a fish that looks like this, right? With some fins and whatever, an eye, right? And you have another one that looks maybe like this, 
right? I'm exaggerating now, but you know, that's the point. Um, okay, that you can find a representation here. that transforms this grid, right, where all the corners or all the intersections of that grid define a landmark point. You can transform this with an affine or a projective transformation to something that's going to look like this, right? Where the point correspondences will define how the object has this, the form, the shape of the object has deformed, right? And this is still used in biology to study the evolution of a species, for example, or how genes uh, interact or, or define the shape of an object. Okay, so um, one of the ways that people have been, so I'm doing kind of a parenthesis now to show one possible, couple possible algorithms um, that you could use. Uh, one way to study this or to use this method to study shape is the Buchstein's coordinate. And here, the idea is that we need to find a shape representation that is invariant to SLS, translation, rotation, and scale, right? So given my landmark points, let's say in 2D, because Buchstein mostly works in 2D, so x, j, y, j, okay? With j from one through k, and uh, k uh, larger or equal than two. Okay. Now, if I want to define my shape, right? So I start with my landmark points capital X, right? Uh, I may want to do a translation of that, so I have to subtract my translation, right? And I need to do a rotation, so I multiply this translated object with a rotation. And then I need to scale that, so I multiply this by a scalar, right? And that's my result. Yep. So note that here, since this is 2D, okay, since this is 2D, can anyone tell me what A is? This is A, 10 by 10 matrix? Probably not. What is it in 2D? Two by two, good. They always say it very, you know, like, I'm not sure. Like, I keep telling you, I don't ask tricky questions. <laughs> they are pretty trivial, right? Obviously, if it's in 2D space, you can only rotate in 2D, so the rotation matrix is two by two, right? And, okay, anyone can tell me what's the first entry in the first row, first column of that matrix? Come on, another gold star. What's the value here? Think about one of the most famous mathematicians of all time. What is it? Euler. Euler? Okay, good. So what's in here? Yes, the cosine of the angle and the sine, negative the sine, negative the sine, the cosine of whatever 2D rotation that we want to apply where theta is the 2D rotation, right? So let's see. I have, um, what's B? B is defined in the real domain of how many dimensions? Two, of course, it's a two-dimensional rotation. And C, what's C? C is just a scalar, right? So it can be any number, any real number, right? So how many unknowns do I have? Again, not a tricky question. Four, Four. very good. Right? So I have four unknowns. So this has four unknowns. Good, good, good. All right. So if 
I have two landmarks. I can have two equations, right, per landmark, x and y. So I have four equations, four unknowns. I can solve the system of equations, right? And if you do that, that's called Bookstein's coordinates. Then the solution, you just write it down, and the solution that you're going to get is the following solution. Again, you may want to do the durations at home to practice, practice, practice. Because these things, you can only learn these things if you practice a lot. Believe me. Um, it takes months, years of practice to actually get good at this. So B is going to be, to, I'm going to give you the final result of the durations. X1 plus X2 comma one half of y1 plus y2 um, of the two points, right? So I have, where is that? Uh, here, I have k equal two, right? And that gives me x1, y1, and x2, y2, right? Um, not surprising. The translation is the average of the two points. The rotation, it's the arc tangent of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And a, it's c times x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, negative y2 plus y1, x2 minus x1. Okay? And finally, c is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared, square root. That's it. Okay. So if you write down the four equations and you solve for these four equations, you have to get this result. Okay? So practice at home, like the third optional homework to do to start getting ready for the final. Right? All right. But there is another solution, right? Because I'm not limited to two points. K has to be at least two, but it could be larger than two. If I have K larger than two, do I know of a method I could use to find a solution for B, theta, A, and C? My four unknowns. Hmm? Linear least squares. squares, thank you. Yes, right? Indeed, and that's what everyone does, right? You just don't use two landmark points and use this, but you use as many points you want and you use linear least squares to find the linear least square solution. Excellent, very good, very good. So you see, we're already in high level vision in advanced computer vision and we're still using least squares. It's amazing, right? <laughs> the power of that method is uh, beyond belief. All right, good. Now, Let's move on to the next shape representation. And that's going to be a complex representation because it's going to be in the complex domain. Um, now, most people call this the Kendall's representation. And here's what we're going to do. So remember that in the real domain, we were basically describing x1 y1, and then x2, y2, and so on, right? As our vector. Um, here, we're going to forget about this. You think, yeah, that's not as good as describing this as x1 as the real uh, part of a complex number plus 
i, now this i here obviously is the square root of negative 1, right? Because we are in the complex domain, times y1, comma, all the way to the k uh, landmarks that we have, xk plus i, yk. Okay? And now this, it's a vector in the complex domain of k dimensions, true? I know what you're thinking. Why on earth do I want to do that? And if you're thinking this, good for you. That's a, the that's a right question. There has to be a reason, right? I'm not just being picky and say, yeah, I want to, instead of representing this into 2k, right, or mk dimensions, if I have each uh, landmark is of m dimensions. I would need an m k dimensional vector if I work in the real domain. Here I only need a k dimensional vector for 2D, right? Uh, but why? Why do I gain by this? So you gain a lot, and that's what we're going to show next, right? So, um, okay, so first. Let's talk about the Euclidean similarity as we did before for real numbers, right? So here I have u, my vector u, that I need to rotate somehow. And now the question is how am I going to rotate this? And then let's say that I'm going to use nu. Is that nu? I, I never remember the, how, how Greek letters work. Is that nu? I think it is, right? Anyone knows? Or is it with that? Eta, that's eta. I thought it could be. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this by eta. Okay, now in the real domain of two dimensions, how do I define a rotation as I did here, right? My rotation here according to theta. Okay, I want to rotate my configuration, right, by theta degrees in the 2D plane. Uh, by doing a simple multiplication, right? So here, that means that eta has to be equal to, anyone remembers this from calculus? Come on, you have to remember. How do you rotate, yes, what is it? What's that? Very good. So e to the power of what? I theta, right? That is a rotation in the complex domain. So isn't that neat that now we can represent our rotation with such a simple multiplication <laughs> factor, right? This is very cool. So. Um, in fact, I actually need to multiply this by some scalar because I want to do all possible rotations as well. So, and this is going to be in the complex domain. And then I'm going to add here maybe a translation. And uh, don't make me say how this, what letter, Greek letter this is, but it's a Greek letter, right? <laughs> is it phi or psi or one of those, right? Okay, um, which in the complex domain. So that's the, exa the exact same Euclidean similarity that we had before in the real domain in matrix form, but now here it's much more simplified, right? Uh, now, in that case, beta is still a real number. It actually is a positive real number. It has to be a positive real number. Uh, theta is between 0 and 2 pi. And this uh, other Greek letter, it's the translation, right? So it's a complex number. OK? So far, so good? All right, so if we start, so in order to achieve this, if we start with a representation u, the first thing I want to do, I want to eliminate uh, the translation, right? I want to have all my shapes be represented in a representation that is translation invariant. 
There are many ways to do that, but let's see one of them. So I could, for example, say z, the vector z, it's my vector u minus the mean of u. So u bar here is the mean over all the elements or entries of that vector u. Okay? What, does, what does, this does is that if I have a shape configuration, x or u in that case here in my space, when I subtract the mean, I center it at the origin. So now all my shapes are centered at the origin, right? This right here is called mean normalized vectors, okay? So mean normalized. There's another way to do this. It's actually um, v uh, not as common in computer vision, but very typically done in the statistics, which is with matrix multiplication. And for this, what you're going to do, um, you're going to define the uh, Helmert submatrix H. And that matrix is given by, um, okay, let's say this, H given by HJ, HJ negative J, HJ, and then zeros. So these are the columns of my matrix. And I'm going to have here j of those and uh, k minus j minus 1 of zeros. Okay? Where each of these columns is equal to negative j j plus 1 square root. So what that means that each row of that capital matrix H actually corresponds to each j repeated j times followed by negative j x j and then just zeros. Okay, so you end up with matrices like this, for example. Um, so let me do it here, so you can see. You could end up with a matrix H like um, H1, negative H1, H2, H2, negative H2, and all these would be zeros that follow, right? Uh, if you had H3, it would be H3, 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 Right, negative H3, and so on, right? Uh, up to, say, M, in which case at the end you'd have, uh, what is it? It's uh, negative M, uh, right, so M HJs and then negative M HJ, right? And on all zeros, so it goes like this. And the cool thing about this is that you could non-normalize your vector instead of doing this, but by simply multiplying u by h. That also eliminates the translation. Let me know when it's time. I don't have my phone with me, so I'm not checking the time. Um, all right, so far so good. Now, let's see if we understand this. If I 
define my shape as a vector u, and then I mean normalize it either like this or like this, right? U, we said, is defined in the space of the complex domain of k dimensions. What is z defined in? What is the space where z is defined in? OK, let's first define the domain. Is it the real domain? Is it the complex domain? Is it integers? Hmm? Nothing's changed, right? Still the complex domain. OK, how many dimensions? What's that? K? Say K? That's not true. Think about it. It's close, but it's not K anymore. Why not? Imagine I multiply this U bar by the vector of all ones. Right? What does that mean? And the same can be done with H, the same trick to understand that. It means that I'm subtracting that vector of a want. And what's a vector of a want? It's a, G, it's a dimension of my space, right? So now my shape, of my configuration can no longer be in that one dimension can never be defined in that one dimension because I've subtracted that. I have taken it out. So I've actually taken out one of the dimensions. So in fact, z now is defined in c k minus 1 in both cases. OK, that's not going to work. Because the vector of all ones, so if I'm in 2D, there's a vector here, the 1, 1 vector, right? 1, 2, that we've called it. That dimension has been eliminated from my space. I can no longer represent anything that dimension because every value in that dimension has moved to the origin, right? So they're all represented in a single point. So I've reduced one dimension from my space representation. Now, so that solved the problem of translation. How about uh, the problem of scale? Well, I could do, so I could do, once I have done translation, I could eliminate the scale by making that vector always of the same length, right? Because what's a scale? A scale is u prime is equal to some scalar c times u prime prime, right? right? So I start with u, I multiply by a scalar, and I get another u. I want to eliminate that. If I normalize by the norm of u, right? If I do the norm of, uh, excuse me, u, my bad. If I do u prime divided by the norm of u prime, right? That is actually going to be equal to c, whoops, u prime prime divided by the norm, right? Obviously, right? Because that's exactly what I do. So imagine that the norm of u prime is 1, right? And, excuse me, u prime prime then the norm of u prime is c, right? If I divide the first one by 1 and the other one by c, then yeah, it's the same thing, right? Obviously. So that's what I need to do. I need to divide this by u minus u bar. So this was called, how, how was this called again? Mean normalized. And this is called, anyone can guess? Norm normalized, OK? This is called norm normalized. And to be correct, this would be a mean 
and norm normalized vector representation of the shape. And now this is invariant to scale and translation. Uh, and translation. Now, all right. U was in k dimensions. This z was in k minus one dimensions. What is the dimensionality of this one? It's in the complex domain of how many dimensions? Yeah, speak up. There are no incorrect answers. I mean, there are, but there are no consequences for them. <laughs> Anyone? What is it? K minus? Minus one? Not correct. Correct. It's K minus two. Why? What's happened? What happens when I divide all the vectors by their norm? All the vectors become of the same what? Length. If I have a space where all the vectors are of the same length, that defines a very specific object. What's that object? Well, in 2D, it's a unit circle. And in more dimensions, the hypersphere, right? So. That is actually not true. I'm, not on, I'm no longer in C. I'm actually now in the complex sphere of K minus two dimensions, SO2. Uh, excuse me, SOK minus two, right? Because if I, had, if I had this case here, right? If I now map all the vectors onto the circle S1, right, then the vectors can only be here on that surface. And any vector that's in here has been projected, right, onto that hypersphere. So all these dimensions that go into the scaling of my shape vector have become one point. So I've eliminated that additional dimension. So now, all of a sudden, I've lost two dimensions in my uh, feature representation. OK. This uh, representation here is what everyone uses, and it's called a pre-shape. The pre-shape space is the space of all possible pre-shapes. Easy enough. Repeat that. The pre-shape space, it's the space of all possible pre-shapes, right? As we have done this uh, before. Um, the term pre-shape, in fact, means that we're only one step away, one step removed from defining the shape of the object because we still have the rotation, right? Ah, OK. So now what we want to do is we want to define a new representation x that is invariant to rotation as well. And it will be done. So we want x to be equal to all my z's times a rotation, given that, that this is in SOM, right? And that's going to define my shape. So let's see an example for the planar case. That means that m is equal to 2, right? That we are in the two-dimensional space. So we already know that this z, right, 
it's defined in the complex hypersphere of uh, k minus two dimensions. And we know that this is given by z such that z complex conjugates z. So remember, this is a complex conjugate that a star, the transpose of the complex conjugate, to be precise. This is equal to what? Now, if I were in the real domain, that would be simple transpose, right? And that's obvious, T, uh, z transpose z is equal to one, the same in the complex domain. But obviously with the transpose of the complex conjugate. Okay. Now we can remove any possible rotation by defining z, or let's put it like this maybe, my set here, uh, z as all the z's times a rotation. How do we say that we define a rotation in the complex domain? e times i theta, right? And now here, theta is from 0 to 2 pi. All right, now, don't write it, this down, or write it down, but make a note. I don't need to know this for the final, <laughs> okay? Now, in particular, the complex sphere, this complex sphere, the complex sphere of k minus two dimensions, which has the points z that are invariant to all possible uh, rotations, actually define the complex projective space. Okay, so this in fact is the same as what we saw before, uh, which is the complex projective space of k, uh, where was it going? k minus two, right? k minus two dimensions. You can write this down if you want to as a result, but again, note that I'm not gonna ask you this, where you could say that the 2D shape space uh, is the complex sphere of K minus two except, right, or modulo, uh, SO2, which is equal to the complex uh, projective space of K minus two dimensions, the same thing, okay? And that's the same that we did in the projective space. When defined the projective space, remember the projective space is nothing else than the real space, right? Uh, of addi one additional dimension, right? So k, my, k plus one, except for the origin, right? So you subtract the origin, okay? All right, I'll see you next week. Have fun, it's getting interesting now. <laughs>